Shadow, a Christmas Story by Harry Stillwell Edwards. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. A Negro convict, awake, lay on his back in the log barracks. Wearied forms stretched out in slumber in long lines to the right and left of him. A chain ran from his shackles, as from theirs, to a stout beam holding him prisoner. He was only a boy when the shackles were riveted on his ankles, his crime an error born of ignorance and lack of moral training. Six years had passed since, dazed and terrified, he had been led from the courthouse, and at twenty he still owed the state of Alabama fourteen years of servitude. Life for him had been fierce and full of agony. Down in the black darkness of coal mines he had labored until accident made him useless and gave him back to daylight and the great green world above. Life then settled into the dull routine of the camp and a hostler's duties, the darkness behind him a nightmare, the days of his lost freedom a dream. The freedom to come was too far away for his imagination to compass. From the right and left of him came the deep breathing of tired men. Sleep with the convict is rest in the full and perfect significance of the word, and he plunges into it after his coarse evening meal as into a tide. That which kept the boy awake was necessarily something novel. It was not pain, had he not felt the lash and the crush of falling coal, nor sorrow, for behind him, among the faraway Georgia hills, was a cabin about which as a child he had played, as all children play, and the sad, undying memory of it shut out all other sorrows. Nor was it a mere yearning for freedom, that had long since given place to dull, unlifting despair. All these, sorrow, pain, and despair, had been the companions of his solitude in many a night of gloom, keeping watch as he slept. The strange new companion of his solitude, from whose divine presence this night all others withdrew, was hope. As he lay, the darkness fell away beyond the radiance of his visitor, and three faces shone out as clearly as the white cloudlets in the blue of summer skies. Sunshine, moonbeam, and starlight stood by his side. Sunshine, moonbeam, and starlight. When all the branches and departments of the state government refugeed into the highlands away from the fever and beyond the vexations of quarantine, the convicts came to Watumpka. And on days when the prison commissioner came to inspect the camp, with him were the three, each less than a dozen years of age, and Sunshine was the youngest of them all. "'Take care of them, Shadow,' he said to the hostler convict, and the black boy, with the memory of his own white folks, far away, filling his heart with joy, took care of them proudly and gratefully. Six years had passed since he had looked on childhood. "'Take care of them?' Ay, if necessary, he would lay down his life for them. Instead, he rigged up swings of plough lines, marked off hopscotch diagrams for their little feet, and taught them how to ride on the back of a superannuated mule. He filled their hours with excitement and pleasure, and when they wearied of exercise, lying in the shade of a great oak, he touched their hearts with the story of his misfortunes. He drew for them graphic pictures of his terrible life in the coal mines, of the men who work where eternal darkness reigns, and the accidents in which lives go out like the light of snuffed candles. And looking over the hills, he told, too, of that cabin where he was born, of his mammy at the wash-tub singing hymns that linger now as the voices of dead slaves on old plantations and of the little miss and her child friends who came down to the big white house in the summer and thence to the gin-house to play in the heaped-up cotton 
Not a line of it all was gone from his memory, not a picture was blurred. And sunshine, moonbeam, and starlight, touched by the divine pity which is eloquent in the hearts of women, old and young, looked into the sad black face of their friend. Goodbye, Shadow, they said, when the quarantine was lifted, and they had come for the last time. Goodbye, we are going to get you out by Christmas. Only you must promise to be good, always, will you? And Shadow, with tears on his cheeks from eyes long dry, pledged himself before the good God looking down on them, his messengers, to be perfect for ever and for ever. And the memory of it all filled the darkness with a flood of beauty, as though sunshine, moonbeam, and starlight were indeed by his side. Not for a moment had he doubted them. So hope furled her wings above him on Christmas Eve, and he lay waiting with wide-opened eyes. Sunshine, moonbeam, and starlight, where were they? The floor vibrated under the convict's head, a lantern flashed, and a guard stood over him. One word broke the silence, one word, his own name, Shadow. It was the day before Christmas, and nothing had been accomplished for Shadow. Freeing a convict was not the trivial matter imagined. The commissioner, besieged and wearied out of discretion, after many laughing refusals, referred the little petitioners to the governor. They knew the governor. Almost daily they saw him pass on their block, and sometimes he laid a hand on a curly head in passing. But he never transacted business outside his office, he said. Never. And always he smiled and passed along. They must come and see him, he said. But the governor was never in when they called, timidly. At least he was never in sight. Then their last day of grace arrived, and they charged Capitol Hill once more. Terrace and portico fell quickly before their assault. The historic spot where Jefferson Davis delivered his inaugural over the cradle of the great Confederacy, and launched the war which was to end in freedom for all the black people, was simply space to be crossed, and they crossed it. They carried their advance into the governor's room. They came without ceremony, and with the red of their country's flag on their cheeks, its blue within their eager eyes, and within their parted lips its gleaming white, they stormed his great chair, planted their victorious arms about him, and demanded an unconditional surrender. The governor seemed to yield. They made a transient summer in the still cold room, and awoke a youth that long had slept within his heart, a youth full of romance and of love. Romance, love, are not these born ever under the sunshine and moonbeams and starlight? The governor seemed to yield. He stroked each curly head and learned each name. He remembered when their respective parents were married. He knew more about them than did the little ones themselves. Then the crash came. Pardon a convict? No. The man had not surrendered. The smiling face faded into a grave, cold face. The governor they knew had vanished, and a new governor, grave, courteous, and firm, but not nearly so nice, had taken his place. But in the sunshine the ice is melted at last, and in the moonbeams and the light of the stars love finds a way. Reason was powerless, refusal impotent. The illogical trinity sat on his knees and the arms of his chair, and admitted all that he urged to be true. They agreed with him in his conception of a governor's duty. They even recognized the claims of good public policy to be against them. And when he had finished, they put their arms about him and asked mercy for their friend Shadow. It would not be so bad, said Sunshine, if we hadn't promised. And the governor laughed. How potent is innocence! 
how weak at times is wisdom driven from his positions one by one the beleaguered governor took refuge behind the judicial ermine shadow had been placed in prison by the judge the judge was really the man to be seen it would never do for the governor arbitrarily to reverse the action of the judge and then he sighed a great sigh of relief why had he not thought of that before give us a letter to the judge then said sunshine sturdily and she handed him his pen point reversed good said the governor yes he is the man you should see do you know the judge yes they knew the judge almost daily they saw him pass on their block and sometimes he too laid a hand on their heads in passing but they had never thought of asking his help in getting shadow out if the judge says you may let him go said sunshine with a tremulous little note in her voice will you do it aha exclaimed the governor with apparent irrelevancy and yet it was pertinent and relevant it meant this little aha spoken to himself and the thoughts within him that the logic of the situation had hemmed him in he must say yes or admit that he had been insincere then he remembered that a great murder trial was on and approaching its close and that even a telephone message could hardly make its way into the courthouse so dense was the crowd yes he answered guardedly if the judge says i may i shall have to do something for shadow but he added pitying their situation you cannot see the judge to-day he is engaged in trying a man for his life and hopes to get through before christmas the three answered not serenely they went forth a friendly irishman in a police uniform was at the foot of the steps dreaming day-dreams perhaps of the childer at home his smiling face was an invitation and they asked him the way to the courthouse courthouse he said courthouse and why should the likes of ye babies that ye are be hunting for the courthouse they are trying a man for his life said sunshine getting her logic mixed and we have a message to the judge from the governor the irishman glanced at the official envelope and whistled and is it important he said it may get a man out of prison said sunshine if we can get there in time it's get there in time ye will said the irishman if i have to carry the last darlin of ye in me arms and on me ed come along with me every corridor every foot of courtroom space was occupied with excited men and the way was blocked over the murmur of their voices rang the voice of the defendant's attorney as he pleaded for his client's life a whisper ran through the crowd the irishman started it they looked with wonder on the three dainty messengers and opened a path for them message from the governor what could it mean the tension was at its highest pitch the sheriff lifting his hand at the entrance to the bar waited until the judge's gavel fell and repeated the whisper aloud a message from the governor your honor and up the aisle trudged the children while a strange silence settled over the great throng and in open contempt of court they climbed up to the judge and presented their credentials all talking while the bewildered official read the message a smile dawned on his stern face which echoed in silence from the crowd if such things can be while he wiped his glasses suspend for five minutes he said to the lawyer who had been speaking the lawyer suspended willingly and his unchanging gaze fixed on the children kept the eyes of every juror riveted there with the children by his side the judge examined a record handed up by the clerk and did the governor send you to me with the note he asked as he turned the pages yes sir said sunshine and he laughed too oh he laughed did he the judge laughed too i see mm, i see and then he read from the record twenty years for robbery and he was a boy when it occurred he shook his head 
Yes, the sentence was too severe, too severe when his youth is considered. His pen swept across the governor's note a few times. He smiled grimly. A path opened up through the throng, and sunshine, moonbeam, and starlight, fading from the scene, left justice at work in the chill and gloom. The state lost its case when the counsel for the defense resumed with the words, Children like those, my friends, await their father's homecoming this Christmas Eve. But they knew nothing of this. Thirty minutes after leaving the governor's room, they entered stormily, gleefully, and planted their victorious colors over the citadel and its vanquished custodian. He learned their story in amazement, and looked with comic gravity on their flushed faces. The Republican form of government is a failure, he said at length. The infantry has usurped the executive and suspended the judiciary. And may we tell Shadow he is free? asked Sunshine. Yes, let freedom be his Christmas present. The child's eyes swam in softer light. Write it down for me, please. Again she handed him the pen, this time point foremost, the little hand trembling with excitement. And, taking his pen, the chief executive wrote this, the strangest, sweetest, gentlest public document that ever issued from Alabama's capital. Dear Sunshine, I have looked into the case of your friend Shadow from Crenshaw County, and am inclined to think that his sentence is too severe. His term is twenty years from September 23, 1893. I have about made up my mind to cut his sentence to less than one-third. You can let Shadow know this, and save this letter to show if needed. He had three mighty nice girls to beg for him, and, you see, I am giving him off more than four years for each girl. Your friend, the Governor. Late that night, Sunshine's father succeeded in getting connection by telephone with Wetumpka, and Shadow was brought into the superintendent's office. Do you know who this is, Shadow? The child's voice annihilated space as it annihilated opposition. Miss Sunshine! Well, Shadow, the governor says you will be free in the morning, and I am so glad. Back over the wires came a great voice, shouting. It was the wordless expression of a soul whose chains had been broken asunder, and to whom the whole beautiful world came back as a Christmas gift. Was there ever such a gift? One other sound came to the listening child, the sound of a falling telephone receiver. Sunshine turned away with her eyes full of tears. The city clock rang out clearly through the night upon the first stroke of twelve. Clapping her hands, she cried aloud, It is Christmas! Shadow is free! End of Shadow, A Christmas Story by Harry Stilwell Edwards Read by David Wales